Mr. Superintendent, there we go. Now we see you and we will get started. We have our entire panel. Uh, apologize for the delay. Uh, we got our panel together and uh, we, are, we are ready to get started uh, with our media briefing. I, I, would, uh, I will open the meeting by saying this, I think is the sixth week in a row that we've done these uh, brief media uh, availabilities. Uh, we're doing this one at the conclusion of the, the first week when many of our uh, sixth through 12th grade students have been in classrooms for the first time this school year. Uh, and we'll have more to say about that uh, shortly during the, during the meeting. But um, as a result, we, we've kind of gone through our, our period of readiness and now we've, we've uh, approached the conclusion of that first week uh, with those students in person. Uh, it is unlikely that we continue a weekly media briefing schedule uh, for the foreseeable future, but we will continue to do these uh, as as topics arise and, and as we need to do it. We, we certainly want to make sure that we continue to offer this level of transparency and insight into uh, the inner workings of, of CMS. And so we appreciate all of the those who have attended all of these briefings uh, and we will continue to be forthcoming with information. With that, uh, I'll just uh, reiterate the ground rules. Uh, we, as we uh, finish the opening statements, uh, we'll open things up for questions and we'll go through about 2.35 today and have about half an hour in the total session. One question per uh, member, per media outlet, uh, raise your hands in the, uh, the, the uh, attendance feed, the participant feature, and I will call one, uh, one journalist at a time to ask a question. With that, I'll turn it over to Superintendent Winston for some opening remarks and then we'll have our, our question session. session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, happy Friday to everyone. Good afternoon. I want to welcome uh, you to our media briefing. Uh, several members of our uh, district leadership team are here again today to provide an update um, or answer any questions that you all may have. And I just want to thank you all once again uh, for taking time out to join us um, this afternoon. So as of today, uh, we have successfully concluded two weeks of in-person learning uh, this year uh, for our students in uh, grades pre-K through 13, with many in grades uh, 6 through 13 attending class in person for the first time uh, this school year. Uh, we've got approximately 57,000 students uh, who were engaged in in-person learning uh, this week uh, with our talented teachers, our counselors and principals, um, in addition, the hardworking transportation, custodial, and nutrition staff have been there to ensure our students are safe and ready to learn. Um, as I visited middle and high schools on Monday, I was extremely pleased to see the smiling faces in carpool lines, in the hallways, and in the classrooms for the first time this school year. And um, I, I want to... Um, note that um, our students are just um, fabulous. They're just outstanding. And so I just, uh, they're extremely resilient as are our teachers. Um, it was one of many firsts. Um, you know, this was their very first time in new school building for our students in sixth and ninth grades. Um, this was their first time meeting their classmates and teachers and staff in person. Um, and it was their first time navigating the cafeteria line uh, an experience we all should have. Um, I think we can all reflect on our first day of walking into a new middle or high school and the excitement and nerves that accompanied that moment. And I wanna thank all of our staff who did an amazing job to make all in-person students feel welcomed and safe. And after months of hard work and preparation, it was truly rewarding to invite so many students back into our buildings. And so I also want to thank the parents and families of the students uh, for getting your child to school on time, completing daily screeners and reminding them to wear their face coverings and adhere to safety protocols. We are all in this together. I know I've said that many times, but I want to repeat that again. We're all in this together. And I'm encouraged as the community spread continues to decrease while access to the COVID-19 vaccine increases. However, as I've said repeatedly, we cannot let our guards down. 
it is our individual responsibility to help slow the spread of the virus by adhering to the three W's. And I think you all know them by now, but I'm going to uh, repeat them one more time. Wear your mask, wash your hands, and wait six feet to maintain social distance. Now, I want to address uh, the difficult um, decision that we announced at the Board of Education meeting on Tuesday. And that was to temporarily close a large portion of our after school enrichment program sites. The toughest decision I must make in leading the district are personnel decisions. Whether a decision affects one person or more of the 19,000 dedicated CMS staff, let me assure you that we explore every possible solution before reaching a conclusion like this. For many years, the ASAP program has provided valuable after school and before school childcare and enrichment for families. And I know that firsthand because I'm one of those families. However, due to decreased demand, we must close many of these ASAP sites. And at this time, our team is working to connect families that are impacted um, with the community partners who currently have openings as well as coordinating transitions from sites that are closing to those 25 ASAP sites that will remain open through the end of the school year. Now, in addition, we are focused on helping the temporarily displaced ASAP staff connect to resources and encouraging them to apply for the many North Carolina Ed Corps positions, substitute teaching and transportation roles in our district. This pandemic has disrupted us in many ways and may continue to have long-term consequences. And so as we move forward, we will continue to evaluate ASAP site reopenings for the 2021-2022 school year and keep you informed. We do have some good news to report about uh, vaccine, vaccination events. To date, we have successfully partnered with the Mecklenburg County Public Health Department, Novon Health, Atrium Health, and the Union County Health Department to promote COVID vaccine opportunities for our student facing team members and those who are older, um, they're, who are 65 or older. And several vaccination events were held or are planned uh, to take place this week at sites in both Mecklenburg and Union counties. Uh, for example, this Saturday, February 27th, tomorrow, CMS is co-hosting an event with the Mecklenburg County Public Health at Metro School, specifically for CMS team members who directly serve our exceptional students. Also this Saturday, McClinic Middle School and Novon Health will be co-hosting a second event for CMS team members, as well as other eligible member, community members. These two events provide approximately 1,500 appointments for our student-facing staff. And on Thursday, March 4th, next week, CMS Transportation and Mecklenburg County Public Health are looking forward to co-hosting two vaccination clinics at our Craig Avenue bus lot. These two clinics are strategically designed to accommodate our bus driver, bus monitor, cafeteria, and custodial team members' work schedules. We're excited about these opportunities and will continue to plan and promote even more vaccination events at both CMS and throughout our community. Now, I wanna provide an update on summer learning and the work our academic team has been doing. Our team is coordinating with community partners and listening to family feedback to develop a summer program that will strengthen core learning and address unfinished instruction. The big questions are, the big questions they're focused on are how to identify the students with the greatest need. What subject areas will be top priority and how will we ensure effectiveness in delivering this important program? And so as part of that work, we're looking at creative ways 
to incentivize the best and brightest teachers to join this effort and analyzing how we will support our students and families with the wraparound services needed to deliver the best possible experience. There will be more to come uh, as we develop this important learning initiative. But finally, I want to end by saying that tonight is the first Friday of the North Carolina High School Athletic Association scheduled CMS varsity football game. And it comes with great news. This week, as you all know, uh, Governor Cooper announced an increase in spectator capacity for high school sports venues. And so we're excited for the families of our student athletes to have more opportunities to attend games in person and see their first, see their student athletes take part in sports on the field or on the court. And so as a result of the governor's announcement, beginning March 1st, CMS will allow 500 spectators at each outdoor football game that's with 300 home guests and 200 visitors tickets available. Parents and families of student athletes will receive priority ticketing access from their schools. For indoor sports such as basketball, the attendance limit will increase beginning with playoff games tomorrow to 120 spectators. 80 tickets will be for home fans and 40 for visiting fans. This is in keeping with the North Carolina High School Athletic Association requirement that at least one third of tickets be to visiting fans. Again, families of student athletes will have priority access to tickets before any remaining are made available for the general public. And so with that, I want to thank you all again for joining us today. Uh, it, it has been a pleasure uh, speaking with each of you all each week to share district news and updates on our readiness to return to in-person learning. And now, if there are no other comments um, um, from members of the team, we will go ahead and open it up to questions. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. The first question is from Ann Helms, and then we have Tanya Mendes, Chandler Morgan to follow that. Ann? Hi. Um, so I believe you all have said that the return of in-person classes meant that high schools went from starting at 8 a.m. when everybody was virtual back to the dreaded 7.15 in the morning, which we all know teenagers love. And I'm hearing anecdotally that some teachers are saying, that students are not doing that, that they are um, seeing a big drop in attendance for first period. Wondered if you all have any statistics on tardies or absences or anything anecdotally and any strategies that you might have to convince your high school students that they really do need to log on at 7.15 in the morning. So Ann, thank you for that question. We do, we do believe that the early on in the week maybe have been, been impacted by the ACT testing. Uh, and that some of our freshmen, uh, some of our uh, high school uh, students may have chosen to actually begin in person on uh, and logging in specifically on Wednesday. Uh, we do also know that we have um, our, several of our students that uh, have opted to um, not attend in person, but but attend uh, on a virtual format on the week that they're supposed to be in person. Uh, schools are adjusting that. Uh, we plan today to pull the um, attendance data for the for this whole week, uh, analyze that data as we once again uh, prepare to look at uh, what our future holds for our students and possibly increasing uh, their frequency and time in person. Thank you. Tanya. Hello, everybody. Thanks for taking my question. I appreciate it. So I'm sure you all are privy to the data that we received this week that showed that course failures tripled for black and brown students. My question is threefold. Did remote learning fail certain groups of our students? Was this something that was foreseen? Did you know the numbers were going to be this bad? And will we see targeted mitigation strategies, perhaps at minority majority schools? I know you're talking about kind of drilling down into what the mitigation is going to look like. Will we see some that's targeted specifically to minority students who didn't perform at the level that they were capable of performing? 
I'll get us started with that particular question and perhaps uh, others will want to chime in. Uh, thank you for that uh, question, Tanya. What we have experienced uh, is not unlike what other districts across the country have experienced. And so I, I wanna be clear, we are all facing the same issues and we're all trying to tackle uh, these challenges that have come our way uh, during the pandemic. And certainly while some students have uh, struggled and have some unfinished learning as a result of the pandemic uh, or as a result of being um, uh, learning in a remote environment, I would also say that uh, the pandemic itself has caused um, some of what we're seeing uh, academically from our students. And so uh, our uh, program, our summer learning program, which uh, we're excited to, to launch in, in a few months and that we're still uh, working to solidify, uh, that will certainly be a step in the right direction to help address the unfinished learning of many of our students. And so we continue to work very hard uh, to um, uh, develop strategies. Um, our uh, grading, our pandemic grading uh, initiative was part of that effort. And we'll continue to do whatever we need to do uh, to make sure um, that our students uh, reach a level of mastery. Chandler. Hi, Superintendent. I had a quick um, question before my real question about clarification on the two events. Um, if we could just get the numbers. So are you saying 1,500 each appointments for the Metro School event and then 1,500 for the McClintock event? And then how many appointments is going to be for the bus driving vaccination events? Uh, but my full question is, is CMS keeping up with how many teachers or employees are getting the COVID-19 vaccine? I can answer the first part of that question. Uh, the 1500 that the superintendent uh, referenced in his opening remarks are uh, through the, the two events, uh, which is really more several, several days of events, but uh, the McClintock event and the ones at the, the new uh, East Mecklenburg site for Novant, between those two opportunities over multiple days, it's about 1500 total uh, appointments for CMS student facing staff. Uh, I'll have uh, Christine or Monica uh, address the rest of the, that question if they don't mind. Sure, absolutely. So it's it's really going to be difficult for us to be able to track exactly how many of our employees take advantage of these opportunities, with the exception of the opportunities that are going to be co-hosted at CMS, and those events are for CMS staff only. So of course, um, after the fact, we would be able to share those numbers. Um, to, to share how many staff were able to take advantage of those opportunities. But many of the other events are either um, co-hosted in a way that allows other community members to also participate or um, they're run and the sign up is, is through other entities. So for example, um, Union County Health Department uh, along with Atrium Health are sponsoring events out in Union County that we have marketed directly to our employees because there are several spots available, but we wouldn't have a way in which to identify which of our employees went to that event to be able to um, sign up and get their vaccination. But yes, we would be able to provide some level of data, um, but across the board, that's really not um, something that would be possible for us to do. Plus, we have a lot of employees who are encouraged to get the vaccines and who have done so through their own providers or through other um, opportunities um, that are not necessarily sponsored by CMS or our partners. So there are clinics popping up, for example, at Walgreens, CVS. So th that is not something that we would be able to track and provide information on. But data that we can, we will be happy to share. Elsa Gillis. Hi, thank you all. Um, I wanted to actually piggyback off of Chandler's question. I just want to confirm the Metro School vaccination event and the Craig Ave bus lot vaccination event, those are specifically school staff only, correct? The other ones could be people from groups one and group two. Do I have that right? That, that, is, that is correct. Uh, and, and the 1500 number that I shared, uh, that we shared uh, related to the Novant uh, opportunities, the McClintock event is, is strictly for CMS staff. Um, the uh, East Mecklenburg, 
they have reserved approximately 300 slots per day for CMS student facing staff via a unique um, link and, and phone number to sign up for those appointments. Uh, but that they will have other community members in those events. They just reserved for us 300, 300 slots approximately per, per day. Okay, so the McClintock Metro School and the Craig Ave bus location or bus lot, those are specific for CMS staff only. That is correct. Okay, thank you. And I see. Uh, I, I want to add something to that. Sure. Um, specifically, it as it relates to McClintock, that particular event, as, as Patrick shared, it is designed for our CMS staff, but I want to say, and I want to make sure that, that the media understands that when there are additional spots available and we have community partnership agreements set up, then we certainly want to make sure that we invite other members in if we have spots available and we don't have any more employees signed up to take them. So sometimes even when there's events that are specifically designed for our staff, we still, in being good partners and good stewards and, and making sure that we that we reciprocate in terms of all these partnerships where we are getting a lot of help from our partners and providing the vaccines to our staff, that we do turn around and make those appointments available when we can if, if we're not able to fill them. And specifically at the um, Metro, I think we covered that, but we do have 300 appointments there specifically for our staff. And then um, at the transportation event, we actually have two different clinics, one that's gonna be in the early part of the day and one in the afternoon for our school um, support staff. Um, and I believe that that is 250 total, but we're working on trying to get more if we can. I see one hand raised. It looks like Elsa, you have another question. Sorry, I same, same um, subject matter. Um, so is there anything that we can do to like get the word out about these events or all the, are the slots already, uh, already full? Um, I'm just wondering if we should be alerting people from a perspective of letting them know that they can sign up for them. I'll, I'll speak for communications here and I'll, I'll say that we certainly appreciate any help that you would like to give us in getting the word out. But in the case of uh, the, the events that, that came available this week with the partnership with Novant, um, those, those slots filled up quite quickly uh, based on just a, one brief communication that we sent to, to all staff. So uh, we certainly will reserve the, uh, the right to, to reach out though and appreciate that offer and we'll certainly take you up on it as we get further into this process. Thank you, Elsa. Yeah, and many of our, um, the targeted events where we're trying to prioritize some of our student facing staff who are um, working with some more of our compromised um, populations in terms of um, compromised immunity or situations where um, face coverings um, sometimes are not always to be uh, always um, appropriate for the situation. We have prioritized those staff first, for example, um, EC staff and then target events like we're doing for our school-based support staff. Those are specifically, um, I wanna say like by invitation only. So we're doing our best to market directly to those employees to respond. I do have some additional good news. This afternoon, we expect to be able to share with communications and all staff um, call out for another. And this is how it's literally happening. As soon as we find out about the information, we flip it around and we share it. So this one we think is gonna be able to go out to all staff. Um, it's another student facing event, another opportunity over in Union County because they were able to access um, additional vaccines like upward of over a thousand that we're gonna um, be sending out for um, opportunities that are coming up just this weekend. So um, that's gonna be posted soon. It'll probably be out on our social media. So look for that. And, and I think it's, uh, we can't say that enough great partners, Atrium and Mecklenburg County Public Health and Novant Health. Uh, and it, we're at the, uh, the mercy of when, when our partners uh, find out that they're gonna get some additional doses of vaccine. That's, that's how this process has worked uh, until vaccine distribution uh, becomes more uh, readily available than, than it's gonna be how it is. And so as soon as we get that information, as Christine said, we turn it around. Our partners have been very good about making sure that we have uh, ample opportunities. When, when they get doses, uh, they wanna put, uh, put shots in, in our student facing staff's arms uh, should they want that vaccine. And we know they do. Thank you, Elsa. Brett Jensen. All right, thanks. Um, Ern, real quick, uh, I know statement in the press release, I'd like to, you know, hear from you, and I, I think the other media 
Rose would as well. Can you just talk about the, the four-year extension that you received and the fact that the superintendent, which has been a revolving for the last decade for CMS? Brett, uh, Brett I, you're, I think you're, I heard most of the question, but not all of it. Yeah, I was going to say, is there? Can you just talk about the uh, the fact that you've got a uh, the your extent will look to solidify the superintendent's role um, instead of the revolving door that has been with CMS for the last decade? Sure. Well, thank thank you for the question, Brett. Well, I'm extremely humbled and grateful. Uh, for the opportunity to uh, serve this district that I love, uh, that has been home for nearly two decades, uh, where uh, my wife and I have two children in the system. And so um, this is um, um, certainly an opportunity, as you mentioned, to provide stability um, longer term. Um, and, uh, but, but let me say, this is, it's not about me. Um, I have an incredible team, uh, many, uh, some of whom you see on this uh, Zoom uh, briefing. I cannot do this work alone. And so I want to be very clear about that. We have uh, incredible, incredibly talented staff um, in our schoolhouses, our teachers, our uh, principals, our support staff outside of the schoolhouse, our bus drivers. And, um, you know, we, we also have uh, wonderful, amazing custodians and uh, we, we, our entire team is incredible. And so my point is, uh, it takes more than one person to do this work and to do it well. And I'm just grateful to work uh, with an incredible team and uh, work uh, with a, a board of education who has entrusted us um, with this incredible opportunity and privilege that we have to uh, wake up every day and go to bed every night um, with uh, on our minds with what is best for kids. And so uh, I'm grateful for that opportunity. Chandler Morgan. Hi, sorry, this is a follow-up question to my follow-up question. Um, and all of the now, slots Chandler, for- Chandler, I was counting. You had two questions <laughs> last time. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. It's, this is just a quick follow-up. So all of the appointments for the bus um, transportation event, they are full. Is that what you said? Or are they not available yet? Are you ta you're talking about the vac vaccination event? We're in the process of sharing that um, with the with the staff who are eligible now, so we'll be able to report back on that um, shortly. It shouldn't be too much longer from now. Okay, thank you. We have about five minutes left. I, I see no hands raised. Are there any further questions? If Tanya, Tanya, Tanya Mendes has a question. And then Brett Jensen. Uh, Tanya dropped off. If she can drop, uh, get back in, then I'll, uh, we'll go to Brett for now. Brett Jensen. Thank you. So hopefully my connection's a little better. When March 10th happens and all the rest of Group 3 opens up, do you think it would be, for lack of a better term, appropriate that each subset have their uh, for um, occupation, just like you guys are doing, um, in terms of, you know, restaurant employees only, and you know, Harris Teeter people only, or whatever, and, and you know, meat processing specifically to that type of occupation. Um. I can take this one, Brett. I'm not sure I heard it all, but I think you were asking once group three opens up, if each of the subgroups would be best served in their own individual groups. And I think it goes back to what Patrick was saying earlier. It's gonna depend on the supply of vaccine. And also it depends on the number of people in those groups because the vaccines we have right now are still requiring um, storage that requires specific temperature settings. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to have a clinic for a really small group of people and effectively have enough vaccine available 
if we have to travel from place to place. So I think if the county has a large supply of vaccine, that they'll continue to do more events like they've been doing at Bojangles where they can get a large number of people in and out in one location because they're set up, the logistics are there and they don't have to worry about the temperature sensitivity of the vaccine. Thank you. Tanya Mendes. I am just going to circle back on, I know I asked a three-parter, so Superintendent, you might have missed the middle part. Did you anticipate these numbers would be as bad as they were as they relate to the course failure rates? I recognize that every group, every grade level saw failures, but did you anticipate that black and brown students would struggle the way they did with these grades? Well, Oh, well, Tanya, so thank you for circling back with that particular question. Um, I, I don't think any of us have a crystal ball um, and could predict um, what you just described. Um, I, I do think um, that, you know, we understand that there were gaps that already existed. And this is not um, an excuse, but it, it's an acknowledgement of what we know is real um, in our district and across our country. There were gaps that existed between uh, our students of color um, and, and other subgroups in our district. And so uh, what this pandemic has done is widen those gaps. Uh, it's not something that uh, we're proud of. And I've talked before uh, that at least um, a portion of this um, is, is, is the fact that we have students whose families have uh, struggled during the pandemic. And so for some of our students, uh, they've had to prioritize um, other things to help support families. Um, and, and again, that's just a reality. And so uh, we continue to do all that we can working with our partners across the community uh, to make sure that uh, our students and our families have the necessary supports that they have um, to, to meet their most basic needs, uh, but also to uh, achieve academically. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, we'll, we'll wrap up uh, this week's media briefing. I think uh, before we do, however, uh, I think uh, Ms. Pajot had something that she wanted to share about some uh, recruitment activity. I do. You know, we, despite all of the challenges of this year, you know, starting last March, so it's been about a year, we've done such an incredible job with our instructional staffing and we continue to have teachers and other instructional support professionals who are just doing an outstanding job and who are really excited about coming back um, to in-person instruction. And, and even the, and our teachers as well who are doing remote instruction. So with that said, we're always thinking ahead, right? We're thinking about next year and we're already excited to announce a spring instructional job fair that's on the books. Um, it's scheduled for Wednesday, April 21st. It's going to be an all virtual event. And what's really cool about that is that anybody who is interested can go onto our website now. They would have to go to the career page and then navigate to teach at CMS where you can find all the information. Um, people will be able to pre-register for the event. We expect to have over 160 schools participating. So this is a really a fantastic opportunity to get in the door early. Um, to be able to chat and upload your resume, chat with administrators at all of these different schools, um, to be considered for teaching jobs um, in the next school year. And this is not just for teachers, so it's for all instructional certified staff, which means our school psychologists, our school counselors, our social workers, media specialists. Um, so please, um, you know, for anybody who's listening, and this is where I, I think, I know we got a question before about how the media can support us. Um, please uh, feel free to share that event share it with your friends, share it with your colleagues, because we have a lot of great opportunities for our fantastic kids at CMS coming up. And we'll, we'll be sure from communications to share that with our, uh, with those of you in the media. So, so thank you for that. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the members of the media and other attendees uh, who participated today.